Keep your Bibles open to John 7. We're preaching through the gospel according to John week by week, verse by verse. We've made it all the way to chapter 7 since I was installed as pastor here. So if you're new, that gives you a sense of how far along. We started in the gospel of John, and our series is called Believe, as the slide says up there. Believe because John tells us, the, uh, the Apostle John who wrote this book, inspired by the Holy Spirit, that he wrote these things so that we might believe. Believe that Jesus is the Christ, and by believing, have life in his name. So the whole purpose of this book is so that you might believe, and so that we might believe and help others believe in Jesus. And John, we talked about last week, Jesus is in halftime of his ministry, because the book starts with a Passover feast, the Jewish Passover feast. Last week, we looked at Jesus at the Passover feast, and then Jesus is crucified over the Passover holiday celebration. That's where we get the Lord's Supper. They were celebrating the Jewish Seder. And Jesus, the Lamb of God, died on the cross as our Passover lamb. So Jesus' ministry extends two to three years, and we know that based upon these holidays. Well, in chapter 7, we're now at another Jewish holiday. If you have your Bible open there, look at chapter 7, verse 1. After this, it says, Jesus went about in Galilee, He would not go about in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Verse 2, now the Jews, excuse me, the Jews' feast of booze was at hand. Okay, so look up here. The feast of booze was a big, big holiday just like Passover, all right? And a lot of these miracles and these discourses come from these big holidays. So Passover happens around the spring, around Easter time. Feast of booze happens around autumn, harvest time. All right? And the Jewish people remember when they were in the wilderness and they lived in these tabernacles or these booths. And so literally to this day, you'll see this around the holidays where people will live inside of tents or huts. They're celebrating this fact that God was faithful to them as they tabernacled in the wilderness. They're also celebrating that they got the harvest in, kind of like Thanksgiving, like we got all the food in and so forth. Big holiday, everybody's going to Jerusalem again. By the way, six months has just passed. Six months between these two holidays. So if you're looking at John 6 and 7, there's a big six-month gap. In verse 1, it says, Jesus went about in Galilee and wouldn't go up in Judea. That's a loaded statement. Like a lot of your gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, right? This is like Matthew chapter 14 to 18, right there. If you want to read it offline, I'm not doing it now. That's all jammed in right there. So right after Jesus feeds the 5,000, a lot of time has passed. And we'll see here at the beginning of this text, look at this at verse 3. His brother said to him, leave here and go to Judea. That's over in Jerusalem, big city. That's where the religious epicenter That your disciples may also see the works you're doing, where? In Galilee, where he was. That's what we read in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. Look at this, verse 5. For not even his brothers believed in him. Okay, look up here. They say, come on, Jesus, we're going to the feast, and if you think you really are the Christ... You think you are who you say, go and show yourselves again. And Jesus will actually push back initially, say, you guys go on ahead. It's not time for me to go just yet. And so he hangs back, but eventually goes mid-course because it's a week-long celebration. And everybody is divided about Jesus. Who is he? I think he is the Christ. I don't think he's the Christ. I think that this guy's leading the people astray. We're going to see all of this in our sermon today. And at our Old New Testament reading, it ends with this. Do you remember this? Jesus stands up on the last day of the feast, pours out some water, says, come to me, I'll fill you up. And then they're divided again. Where is this man from? And they literally had sent officers to arrest him. The Jewish leader sent officers to go bring him in, arrest him. But they don't arrest him. Why don't they arrest him? They actually say, look at verse 46. I know we're jumping all around, but this is coming to the main idea of today's text. The officers answered, no one ever spoke like this man. We were going to arrest him and he started to talk to us and we lost the nerve. (laughs) No one ever spoke to us like this. There's nobody like this guy. You guys don't know what you just asked us to do. We went to go arrest him, and we had to back away. There is no one like him. None like him. There's none like Jesus. 
And so today's sermon, if you're taking notes, is called Like No Other. And from the Feast of Booze, we see that Jesus speaks like no other man. And we're going to see four ways, four ways that Jesus is like nobody else you've ever encountered. The amazing Christ, the amazing Jesus Christ that speaks like no other men. So he speaks like no other men. The first point from our message today, no other man alive comes directly from the Godhead. So if you're taking notes, the first point there, put it up. No other man alive comes directly from the Godhead. And I'll explain what I mean. Drop to verses 14 through 18 and 25 to 31. So Jesus goes up about the middle of the feast. Do you see that in verse 14? Jesus went up into the temple. He began teaching. The Jews therefore marveled, saying, How is it that this man has learning when he's never studied? He never went to seminary. He didn't come to, you know, over here and take Bible classes. So Jesus answered them, My teaching is not mine. But look, listen to this. His who sent me. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I'm speaking on my own authority. The one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory. But the one who seeks the glory of him, God, who sent him, me, God sent me, is true. And in him there is no falsehood. Now drop down to verse 25 through 31. Well, some of the people of Jerusalem therefore said, Is not this the man whom they seek to kill? And here he is speaking openly, and they say nothing to him. Can it be the authorities really know that this is the Christ? But we know where this man comes from. Listen to that. They think they know where he's from, right? We know know where this man comes from, and when the Christ appears, no one will know where he comes from. So Jesus proclaimed as he taught in the temple, You know me? You know where I come from? But I have not come of my own accord. He who sent me is true, and him you do not know. I know him, listen, for I come from him, and he sent me. So they were seeking all the more to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour, his time had not yet come. Yet many of the people believed in him. They said, when the Christ appears, will he do more signs than this man has done? Okay, look up here. They say, we know where you're from, Jesus. We know where you're from. You're from Galilee. You remember where our New Testament reading ended? They're debating back and forth. Even Nicodemus starts to stand up to him. Remember Nicodemus from chapter 3? This Jewish religious leader, he's like, they're basically saying Jesus is guilty until proven innocent. He's like, whoa, 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 boys, that's not how it works. And they're like, if you look at the end of this, he says, does our law judge a man before first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? And they replied, are you from Galilee too? Basically, are you an idiot too? I mean, search and see that no prophet arises out of Galilee. And we've talked about this. You can watch the videos from before, listen to the messages before. Galilee, Jerusalem's like the spiritual elites, all right? Like, this is the Rome. This is the Mecca. Like, these are, they think very highly of themselves. If he had studied, he would have done it at Jerusalem, like Paul, you know, like at the, that's where you go. Galilee is like, you know, the other side of the tracks. And by the way, Jesus is from Nazareth, which is like the armpit of Galilee, right? That's, this guy is a nobody. No prophets come out of Galilee. You know where he's from. This doesn't add up. In fact, they even quote the prophecy we read about. The, the, the one, the Christ is supposed to come out of Bethlehem. Now, spoiler alert, you and I know this, right? If you remember Christmas, Jesus actually was born in Bethlehem, but he wasn't from Bethlehem because of that census. You remember that? Mary and Joseph go to Bethlehem. So he did fulfill that. They just didn't realize that at the time, that Jesus was from Galilee and from Bethlehem. But here's the thing. Jesus doesn't even appeal to that. Guys, you didn't realize that I was actually born in the hospital in Bethlehem. So I'm actually, he didn't, he didn't even want to get into that fight with you. Because you know where Jesus is really from? He's not from Galilee or Jerusalem or Bethlehem. He's from God himself. And that's exactly what he says. He says, you think you know where I'm from? You don't know where I'm from. I came from heaven to speak these words to you. God sent me. And by the way, when Jesus says this, as you study his words here and elsewhere, it's not like 
the prophet Elijah or, you know, Moses, where, yes, God sent those people. This is different. God so loved the world, he sent his son, that the word of God, the eternal word of God put on flesh to walk around in human feet and speak the very words of God. So when we say Jesus was sent from God, it's not the same as the prophets. Jesus came from the very bosom of the Father, is what John says. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Most of our Trinitarian convictions as Christians come right out of the gospel according to John. Eternally begotten, not made. God from God, light from light. God is light. Jesus is the light of the world. All of that right in here because Jesus is God. God the Son, the eternal Son of God. And Jesus came from God and he walks into this feast and he walks into America and he walks into Haverford Township and he says, you don't know where I'm from. I'm from God. And when I speak, God speaks. Listen to me. I didn't need to go to seminary. All the things they're studying are about me. I know that, you know. When he was a boy, 12 years old, remember, he went to the temple. He was teaching the rabbis, right? He doesn't need that because he's from heaven. And he reveals heaven's truths to us. Speaks like none other. No other prophet has ever said that, by the way. This is unique to Jesus alone. So the first way we see that Jesus is like no other man, like no other man alive, Jesus says he comes directly from the Godhead. Secondly, like no other man alive, Jesus, like no one else, challenges our assumptions more. He challenges our assumptions more. This comes out of the first portion, verses 1 through 13, and then we'll drop down to 19 through 24. But you remember his brothers like, why don't you go up there if you're really who you say you are? And look at verse 6. We'll just start there. Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come, but your time is always here. And you'll see this theme of time and hour over and over again. Remember that, because we'll talk about it later when Jesus' hour does come. But his time has not yet come. Your time is not here. Look at verse 7. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me. Why? Because I testify about it that its works are evil. You go up to the feast. I'm not going to go up to the feast. My time's not fully come. After saying this, he remained in Galilee. But after his brothers had gone up to the feast, they went up with the big crowds on the first day. He goes up later when it is his time, the middle of the feast. Then he also went up, not publicly with the crowds, but privately, alone. The Jews were looking for him at the feast, saying, where is he? And there was much muttering about him among the people, while some of them said, he's a good man. Others said, no, no, he's leading the people astray. Yet for fears of the Jews, no one spoke openly about him. Now drop down to verse 19 through 24. 19. So just talked about how God had sent him. He says this to the crowds. Has not Moses given you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. Why do you seek to kill me? The crowds answered him, you have a demon. Who's seeking to kill you? Jesus answered them, I did one work and you all marveled at it. Moses gave you circumcision, not that it's from Moses, but from the fathers. And you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision so that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me because on the Sabbath I made a a man's whole body well? Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. Jesus challenges our assumptions like no other man. You'll see in this text twice, but really throughout all of the Gospels, that Jesus just knows how to rub us. <laughs> he comes and if you think you know Jesus and you just like Jesus, make sure you've read all of Jesus at first because Jesus can startle you, right? Here, he, there's two ways he challenges our assumption in this text, but it's really the ministry of Jesus is to challenge you, right? To wake you up and to get you right with God. Not wake you up. All right, you go back to sleep. (laughs) Sorry, Chance. That's my new nephew. Love you, buddy. Um, He goes to his brothers. He says, guys, everybody loves you. You know why? Because you agree with what they're doing. I don't. 
all right? I see what's going on in the world, and I call it a spade, a spade. It's evil. It's wrong. But you know what happens when you do that? The people who like spades don't like you, right? When you say that's evil and people like to do evil, they don't like you, all right? And Jesus gets himself in trouble over and over again, right? Verse 7, because he confronts them. He confronts what they're committed to. And he says, the things that you love most, the things that you are most committed to, those things are not the right things. They're darkness and I'm light and I'm going to shine some light on this and expose it. And people who come to Jesus come to the light according to John 1 so that what is done is seen through God. But here's what people do that don't want light. They retreat from Jesus so they can go further in the darkness and live my own way according to my own value system. Thank you very much, Jesus. And by the way, this is not just for irreligious people. Jesus then goes after the religious people too and challenges their assumptions. You remember that where they're saying, you're seeking to kill me? And then he pulls out one of the things that really ticked them off from his earlier miracle. You'll remember from chapter 5, again, go back and listen to the sermon if you want to know what happened. But basically, there's an invalid. He's been unable to walk for 38 years. Jesus tells him to rise up, get up and walk, and pick up your mat and walk. Happened to be the Sabbath. And all the authorities cared about is, who told you you could pick up your mat on the Sabbath? You're not allowed to do that. And then they find out, he goes, tattles on Jesus. Oh, I found him as Jesus. And they go, what? This man come from God, told you to pick up your mat and walk on the Sabbath? Heaven, no, right? No way! Wrong day, Jesus. And Jesus comes back and he, look at this. He says, guys, you have the wrong assumptions here. Your priorities are off. He actually makes a case here. Listen to what he does. He says, all right, let's take circumcision, for example, right? That's when in Jewish culture, the baby is circumcised after they're born. Well, there's a certain number of days that after the baby's born, they're supposed to be done that. But someday at times, that day falls on a Sabbath. So what does the priest do? He circumcises the baby, right? Because you got to circumcise the baby. Like, so they do it because... That's more important than observing the Sabbath. you got to circumcise the baby, right? He says, not that it came from Moses, the law of Moses. It actually came from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's what that comment's about. It came far before Moses. But here's his point. It was more important, and you let them do that. I just made this guy a well that was sick for 38 years, and you think it's more important for him to be a cripple on the ground than to be healed. Your priorities are completely off. And you're using your religion, by the way, to create toxic behavior in humanity. Jesus challenges our assumptions. And he still does this, by the way. Maybe you're irreligious and you love evil things. Jesus is going to call you out and say, that's evil. And you're not going to like it, but Jesus is right. And you're not. If he's from God, he's right. Or you might be really religious here, but you're using your religion in a toxic way to hurt people instead of help them and neglect the greater duties to love God and to love others. And you're not doing that because you think you're obeying God. And all the while, Jesus is saying, wake up. There's something more important. People matter more than that. God is more important than that. And I don't know in your life or our church, but Jesus wants to sniff them out. And Jesus can sniff them out, and he will call us out on them. He challenges our assumptions like no one else. Jesus is committed to reforming his church more than any of us are. We just have to listen for the voice of Jesus to read his word. And it requires some complexity to say, there's two good things, and I can't do both. Jesus, what's what's your priority? God, what's more important? Because sometimes I can do the right thing and it's the wrong thing because there was something more important that I used the right thing to neglect. That's a whole other sermon and a whole other time. We have a whole chapter to cover. But do you see what he's doing here? He won't let the religious or the irreligious off the hook. He's got a challenge for all of us. And we need to hear from him. There's no one like Jesus. 
Thirdly, at the Feast of Booths, Jesus speaks like no other man. No other man alive goes completely out of reach. Goes completely out of reach. This comes out of verses 32 through 36. This is where those officers are sent to arrest him. They're like, get him out of here. Zip him up. Get him gone. All right? So they send the officers. Get him out of the festival. He's ruining our holiday. Remove Jesus. Censure him. Verse 32, the Pharisees heard the crowds muttering about these things about him. The chief priests and the Pharisees sent officers to arrest him. Jesus said to them, I will be with you a little longer. Then I'm going to him who sent me. You will seek me, and you will not find me. Where I am, you cannot come. The Jews said to one another, Where does this man intend to go that we will not find him? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What does he mean by saying, You will seek me, and you will not find me, and where I am, you cannot come? Jesus says, Guys, you're coming after me? I'll be here just a little bit longer, and then I'm going somewhere where you can never get me. You'll never be able to get me. What's he talking about? Where is Jesus going that we can't touch him? He's going back to where he came from. Now, he doesn't tell them there. They're just kind of scratching their heads going back to him like, why did you arrest him? I don't know. He's, he's talking like no one we've ever heard. But you and I know where he came from and where he's going. And by the way, let me just unpack a few details here. They're like, is he going to go to the dispersion and speak among the Greeks? This is a big deal at that time because if you're Jewish, you spoke in Hebrew was the right way to speak, but a lot of them were starting to speak Greek and they were scattered because of a, a diaspora, a dispersion. Alexander the Great conquered them in the 4th century BC. And so you see in the book of Acts, for example, on remember Pentecost, all these different languages come together because all the Jews are scattered, and they're like, maybe Jesus is just going to leave Judea and Galilee all together, and just go out and hang out with the Greeks. Now, obviously, that's not where he's going. He will go to the ends of the earth, by the way, through us, through the church, which is what Acts talks about. But Jesus is going far further than Egypt. He's going far further than Antioch. He's going back to heaven, and you can't touch him, you can't extradite him, you can't beat him up again, you can't do anything to Jesus. Jesus is now untouchable. He's untouchable. You know, um, you heard of extradition, right? Where like, say you break the law in America, and you're like, I got an idea, I'm going to Canada. You'll never get me in Canada, because they got different laws, and their cops don't work for you. So you go to Canada, but then the U.S. picks up the phone and calls Canada and says, yo, Stefan's up there, bring him back. And they're like, yep, we got an agreement. And they pull you back. And you got him. It's called extradition. Now, sometimes countries don't get along like North Korea. You know, if, if you're North Korean, you come to America, North Korea picks up the phone and says, yo, send them on back. We're like, no thanks. We'll keep them right here. But imagine if you wrote something on Facebook about North Korea. And you're like, that country's crazy, and that leader's nuts, right? They're out of control in North Korea, and you forget about it for five years. And then you take a vacation in China just to do some sightseeing, and all of a sudden in your hotel, <laughs> people break in and lock you up, and they say, you're going to North Korea, buddy, and they, you realize, holy smokes, they could get me. They could get me. I could still be killed by North Korea, even as an American, if I'm in the wrong place. There's places we can go, even when we're innocent, where you can get us. Jesus is saying here, listen, boys, I'm going to a place. It's not among the Greeks. It's not in the diaspora. It's not even in this world. I'm going to somewhere where nobody can touch me. And how does he do that? He dies so that we might live destroys death on the cross, rises again physically, bodily, and then is swept up into another dimension. I don't know where heaven is, but Jesus is there, and you can't touch him, and he's praying for you and for me, and he's pouring out his spirit on his church today. At the right hand of God the Father, Jesus is completely out of your reach 
You might not like what he has to say. You can't extradite him. You can't call him to account. No one's going to crucify him again. Everything that he said is true. He's deposited the truth to the world. And now you have to deal with that. But he's saying, boys, I'm going somewhere that you will never touch me. Jesus is untouchable. And you have to wrestle with what he has said. No one's ever said that, and no one else can do that. That's why I used that illustration before, if that was unclear. You can't get away, right? There's always somewhere that you can go where you can be gotten. Not Jesus. Jesus is like no other man. Fourth and finally, Jesus is like no one else. He speaks like no one else. How so? At this feast, like no other man alive, he tells us how he pours God's Spirit into our hearts. Fourth and finally, Jesus pours God's Spirit into our hearts. This comes out of verses 37 through 39. We read this in our New Testament reading, but I will read it again because it is huge. Listen to this. On the last day of the feast, the Feast of Booze, the Feast of Tabernacles, the great day, the final day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink, implied from me. Whoever believes in me, as the Scripture has said, listen, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Okay, look up here. No one's ever said that before, and no one else can do that. What does Jesus say on the last day of the feast? Now, you need to understand something about this feast. At this feast, there was a ceremony where the priest would go to the Pool of Siloam. Remember that, because in chapter 9, it's going to reappear with the healing of the blind man. But anyway, he goes to this pool, gets a golden pitcher, whoop, golden pitcher, fills it with the water, and goes back to the temple area, pours it next to the altar as a symbol of God's abundant reigning of blessing. Every day, provision of rain for the future. And also there were prophecies about God's spirit being poured out. And they would go every day remembering and pouring it out on the altar. Next to the altar, the water pouring out. Remembering that God's provision. And Jesus comes up on that last day after all the water has been poured out. And he says, all right, boys. If any of you are thirsty, come to me. Because that water pouring out ceremony... We talked about this. The whole Bible is about Jesus. All points to him. That's about me. And there's an abundance of water of God's spirit that will be poured out on you and that will come into your life, into your heart, and it's going to happen because you believe in me. When you believe in me, I will pour out the Spirit of God into your heart and it will flow out of your bodies in this abundance of life, power, God's provision and strength where you are dry and weary and parched in soul. We saw that with Jesus at the woman at the well. Come to me. Come to me and I will quench that spiritual thirst. But Jesus goes further in this passage than he does with the woman at the well. He connects what he's going to do with whom he's going to do it. Because we talked about the Trinity, right? Father, Son, and Spirit. When Jesus went out of reach, when he went up to heaven, we'll see this later, he says, I'm going to send a helper. I'm going to send the third person of the Trinity. He doesn't use those words, those are ours, but that's the way to explain it. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to you. And when Jesus goes to heaven, he will pour God's spirit into your heart so that rivers of living water will flow into you, through you, and out of you to replenish the world. Who says that? Jesus says that. No one says that but him. No one. And there's a promise here. Do you see it? Because... By the way, John puts the comment in there, the Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Jesus has been glorified now. This promise, 
Jesus will cash this check right now. He's glorified. Spirit is available. If any one thirsts here at Manoa Community Church in Haverford Township in 2018, if anyone here thirsts, Jesus is speaking to you. Come to him. Drink of him. Believe in him. And out of your heart will flow rivers of living water. You know, I mentioned at the beginning of the sermon that Jesus' brothers didn't believe in him. Do you remember that? Did you know that they all came to faith in Christ after he rose from the dead? Bro, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> we were wrong. You're right. James and Jude, by the way, two of the epistles written by Jesus' half-brothers telling us to follow Jesus. Nicodemus, who came to Jesus secretly by night, is already sticking up for Jesus here by the end of the gospel, comes to faith in Christ. And you might not believe in Jesus right now. Jesus is patient with you like he was with them. But Jesus is after you. You wouldn't be here, by the way, if he wasn't. There's millions of people driving by. You're here listening to Jesus. He's after you. He's after you. And he's telling you right now, come to him. Come to him. So here's how I want to close this sermon. If you'd like to come to Jesus, this is your chance to do that through faith, through a prayer, to pray to Jesus. So let us bow our heads, close our eyes. And if, as you've heard the words of Jesus and you agree, he's like none other, and you feel Jesus challenging the evil in your life, and you want to repent of that, today is a day of salvation. If you're feeling thirsty spiritually and you want to be quenched, Jesus provides the Spirit of God to fill that in your life. Come to him, believe in him, pray something like this to him. Jesus, I believe that you are the Christ. I believe you came from heaven. I believe you died for me and returned to heaven and now make your spirit available to all who call on your name. Jesus, pour out your spirit into my heart right now. Fill me in the place that nothing else can touch. Fill me in the driest place of my soul with your presence the presence of your spirit. God, come and live inside of me. Forgive me of my sins. Make me your child. I believe that you are like no other. I believe in you. I pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.